Divine Truth Assistance Group Group assistance sessions putting principles of divine truth into action. This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education in Love series. In the Understanding My Will presentation, Jesus helps us understand what our will is, where our will comes from, what influences our will, will versus willpower, and how negative and positive changes to our soul-based will occur. Recorded on 11th of March 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. There you go. Bit of Billy Fields for you there. Reminding you where your bad habits come from. <laughs> okay. My favourite t-shirt looks all right, huh? Nice on the back too, isn't it? So, bright, bright enough. Yeah. Okay. Back to front. <laughs> I like I like shirts that don't have a plain back. I like them with a like pattern on the back or whatever. Yeah. No, and and the material. This material is just so soft. It's like oh. <laughs> I don't know. It's a company in Spain that yeah, I get my t most of my t-shirts from. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen them here in Australia. Usually, it, only when we go overseas do we buy some shirts. <laughs> so only time I ever buy any clothes is when I'm overseas, usually in London or in or in or in you know one of the European countries. They usually have this this com this company. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this uh, particular discussion is about understanding our will. So understanding my will. <laughs> okay. So the first thing we need to understand is God has given us this beautiful gift which is free will. You didn't have to ask for it. <laughs> Some of you <laughs> would prefer to not have it. <laughs> but uh, it is a gift that God gave every single soul. Every single soul that God created in the universe. Every one of God's children has this gift. The gift was given to the soul collectively, by the way. So remember that you are only one half of a soul. And the gift was given to the entire soul. So that means that both halves of the soul need to understand how to use it. So you can't rely on the other half to use it for you. Does that make sense? Each half needs to develop fully this gift to fully understand it. So it's a major thing to understand that. Many of you if you see historically the way you know relationships occur many relationships occur um, in such a way um, that the that they, they abdicate the gift to the other half right and that's an indication that both halves don't know how to use the gift that's just an aside just rub that off so here we have this gift this beautiful gift that you will spend the rest of your existence developing. It began to be developed at the moment of your conception. Right. Now, it's your personal development of this gift. So there's a, bit, there's a difference between free will itself, which is the gift that came from God, and your personal development of it which leads you to having your own will. So you can say it's my will. And remember, when I'm talking about my will now, I'm talking about my and my soulmates added together will. You follow? 
it's our collective will which is being given as a gift. Yeah. So can you see God's given the gift, but at, this, but at the time of conception it's undeveloped, but it begins to get developed. And as it gets developed, you could now say that this gift is not free will anymore, but it's actually your will. Your will is your choice to develop this gift of free will. Now why did God give you the gift of free will? Because God did not want you to be automated. <laughs> he didn't want you to be an automated person. He wanted you to be able to have free thinking capacity, free feeling capacity, the ability to choose what you wanted to do for the rest of your life rather than be some robotic creation of God. So the whole concept, the whole concept of you doing God's will is in itself quite flawed because God actually gave you will so that you do your will <laughs> not God's God of course doesn't tolerate uh, what I'd classify as anarchy in the universe though so God created a whole heap of laws which govern how your will is exercised if you try to exercise your will out of harmony with laws then there will be certain consequences that occur, breaking the law. And uh, these, all of these laws are all based around love. So, so, so when we want to, in other words, break the laws of love, there are going to be consequences that impact upon, uh, give us a feedback uh, to how we're using our will. But in the end, it's still your will. You have the choice to do what you like with it. And the beauty of it is if you choose to do anything that's harmonious with love, you can pretty much do anything harmonious with love. It's just up to you. Right? So you've got the capacity to do anything as long as it's harmonious with love without the constraint of law. In fact, a person who has brought their will in harmony with love is no longer constrained by any law. because the law only comes into force when you break it, basically. Right? You're not really constrained by law. But there are laws that actually are, are not place any constraints on you at all. And the more you discover about love, the more you can freely exercise your will. Right? So that's also an interesting fact. And we'll be looking at that when it comes to understanding God's laws about those particular things. So here we are, we've got uh, the gift of free will given to us by God. It translates into my will from the moment of conception. So we're talking about conception. What happens at conception is the will of others begins to have influences upon you, just like your will begins to have an influence on others. And this is one of the things we need to come to learn about our will, is that we cannot exercise our will in isolation. It always has some kind of effect on something around us. Right, so this is a very important thing to understand about our will. So from the time of conception, the will of others has often influenced our will. So unfortunately what happens is the, uh, when we're conceived, so if we just uh, draw a little diagram here, we'll just rub that out and just draw a little diagram over here. So we've got mummy, mummy and daddy. And little baby, Jesus. <laughs> right. His will is going to be quite influenced by the, what, what has already happened to the will of the adults. Right. So already there's influences upon the will. And God created it to be that way, in fact. We, we need to understand that other people can influence our will and we can influence the will of others. We need to understand that influencing the will isn't a bad thing. It's just how it's influenced that get, is a bad thing. Does that make sense? Because you can influence your, uh, the will of another person in a positive direction and that's, uh, that's going to be loving. Now celestial spirits try to do th with that with you all the time. They've been doing that with you the whole of this eight days that you've been here trying to influence your will in a positive direction. So influence is not a negative thing. It just becomes negative depending on how we choose to be influenced. 
In other words, how we exercise our will to be influenced will determine whether it's negative or positive. Make sense? Okay. Now, sometimes changing your will can be really, really simple. But if you don't have any emotional injuries inside of you, changing your will can just be a simple emotional choice to make a different decision. But unfortunately, it can also be quite complicated because, because all the emotions inside of us drive the exercise of our will. So, so if there's a whole heap of unhealed emotions inside of us that drive the influences upon our will, then that means that we, we, we might, to change our will might mean changing a whole lot of emotion inside of us in order to change our will. So it can be really simple, but also can be really complicated. Is there any questions so far about so Jane? If we come down the front, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Emma. So if there is um, the will of the whole soul mm -hmm. also, mm. the Not many of you considered that, have you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first half of the soul that is conceived and is affected, their will is affected, does that then uh, start to automatically affect the other half, yeah. other half when they're conceived? Well, of course it does. Let's say the first half of the soul is conceived in Europe. Then it's highly likely the second half of the soul is going to be conceived in Europe as well. So already, already it's having an influence on the other half's will. Hmm. How about the injuries that are starting with? Of course, if, I, if I'm completely blocked to receiving love, I can meet my soulmate, walk straight past her, wouldn't know her. So I'm impacting her will, aren't I? Let's say she can recognize me, but I can't recognize her. I'm impacting her will. Yeah. And as infants and Of also? course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, right from the conception. Interesting thought, huh? Not something many of you have given much consideration to. Hmm. Thank you. It's very powerful, actually, because the, it, one half of the soul can greatly influence the will of the other half just by the exercise of its own will. So, for example, when I recognised and, and went through all of the feelings about my own identity, from that moment on, I began influencing the will of Mary with regard to her identity. While I was blocked to my identity, I'm also influencing her will to remain blocked to hers. Does that make sense? Yep. That's how it is. That's how God created it to be, actually. Yeah. So the reality is, isn't it very interesting, the reality is that all of you have believed that you could do what you want, when you wanted, how you wanted, and with whom you wanted, Hmm. Not quite true, eh? Because the reality is that you're half of the will of your one soul. And so, so that is having an effect on somebody else, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Already. Yeah. So e every time you decide to shut down love, you're influencing the other half of your soul, if, even if you're influencing no one else. You could be a hermit living on you know, an island out in the Pacific. You shut down your half of the soul, you're already influencing the other half of your soul, the other person who's your soulmate. You're influencing them. You're, you're preventing them from fully enjoying their life because God created the two soulmates to be together. You're preventing them from fully enjoying their life. Every sin-based choice you make prevents the other half of your soul from fully being able to experience the happiness of their life. You're already having that effect. Mm. Interesting to, things to ponder about, right? Yeah. Okay, is there, Nat, you had a question? You kind of just answered it. Um, mm. oh, sorry. Yeah, you, um, so with the law of compensation then, for mm. every unloving action I've taken that has an effect on the other half of my soul, mm -hmm. 
does the law of compensation affect that half of the soul or just my half because of my actions? Well, it's going to affect both of you, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, it does affect them and what happens to them. So it's definitely affecting both of you. And in contrast to that, if I do something in harmony with love... It affects both of you. It affects both of us. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> well, not the first bit, but not the second the bit, yeah. <laughs> well, I think both, both things are wonderful. That's how God created it. It's loving. It's loving creation, yeah. so it's definitely wonderful in both directions. Is it? So, yep, Felix, thanks. Could you just give a quick example of, of that? Where it, um, I just gave one just before to Jane, where I said if I was blocking love and the other half oh. of my soul wanted to love me and that's what would make oh, okay. her happy, and if I'm blocking love, then I'm preventing her happiness. So that's an example to me. But if it's something that, uh, um, you know, that's just my choice and then... Felix, nothing's okay. just your choice. But There's it be not a single th choice you can make that's just okay. your choice. Okay, I go... <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's the point. There's nothing that's just your choice. This is your addiction to want to be like... You don't want the other half of yourself. You, you, you know, honestly, it's a huge injury emotionally on the planet. You don't want the other half of yourself, so you want to believe that everything is just up to you. And it's not. It's not just up to you. Because God gave free will to the whole soul. God gave free will to the whole soul. The whole soul is, is, is going to get influenced by whatever half of the soul chooses to do, is it not? Come down to. <coughs> Just hold it nice and close. Uh, Nell, uh, would this affect an aborted child in Summerland? Of course. Of course. Uh, the will of the parent who aborted the child, the child's now in Summerland. It now is definitely prevented for the first 80 years or 90 years of its life from meeting and from having a love based relationship with its soulmate, isn't it? That's a huge impact, isn't it? Yes. Like the majority of us on earth seek out a partner because we have this draw to the other half of our soul, of course. That's the reason why we do it. And, and, and that particular person who's left on earth is not going to be able to do that very easily because of the choice of the parent to abort the child. So, yeah, huge impacts. Uh, our decisions, we, we have, because we don't know the truth, we have huge, uh, you, you know, we, we don't realise the huge impacts that we have, are having on the wills of other people in terms of our decisions that we're making. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's knocked you around a bit, that one, hasn't it? Yeah. Dave? So uh, for somebody like me who gives away my will, how does that affect the other half of me? Well, if you give away your will, can you see straight away that you're giving away your will to whomever? You know, uh, even if you are with your soulmate, you can see it's a problem because you're basically making one half of your soul responsible for the whole of your soul. That's placing huge burden of responsibility on the other half, is it not? And then, and then, and then also on top of that. If you give away your will to someone who's not your soulmate, then basically you, you, you're, the other half of your soul is not going to feel, feel you very much, are they? No. Because you've already given up your will to, to be with someone else or, or you've you're given up your will to someone else who's not your other half. Yeah. You can see big M impact our decision, isn't it? Like, we don't realise, do we? It's like, man... Now, now, from day one for the majority of you that I've ever given a presentation, you were presented with the concept of soulmates, where you're not. And you've given no thought to it, really, <laughs> of how much your will impacts upon their choice and decisions. Isn't it interesting, like, we can be presented with a truth and not give it any real consideration for years and years and years and years. Yep. Which is an interesting fact as well. Okay, so we have our complete soul, which is being given this gift of will. And I'm drawing it like a heterosexual soul half. Of course, it could look uh, otherwise. And uh, we have 
God who can have a relationship with both both halves, of course, and but but basically it has a relationship with the whole soul. God is wanting a relationship with the whole soul, not the two halves. As individuals, God wants a relationship with the whole unique soul. That's why in your long term future, depending and how long this is depends upon you, and um, you can get to the point of having a soul union and at that stage you will start to experience what it feels like to have a relationship with God as a whole soul rather than just two individual halves. At the moment, most of you are not realising but you're keeping your soul apart through the exercise of your will. So the gap between the two halves of the soul, which, which you're currently experiencing, is a direct result of the exercise of each half's will. To remain in that state so so your will has a huge impact upon even your own happiness and the happiness of the other half of yourself and that's notwithstanding what else it has an impact on yeah. so why, why did God do this What do, do you think might, God might have done this for? Any ideas? If we come to Sandra. From my intellect and from what you've said before, is because God loves us and wants us to experience, um, to love each other and to be together and have fun together and experience the universe together. You and keep saying together, but... But I feel the opposite. <laughs> well, it, well, it's not even really together. You're one soul. Oh, yeah, okay. So there's no such thing as, like the, even the current concept is togetherness, which basically tends to suggest there's a separation before you can be together, right? And what I'm suggesting to you is from God's perspective, the two halves of the soul are not separate beings. God created the soul, remember? The soul, the complete soul is the child of God, not the two halves. The complete soul is the child of God. So if God created the complete soul and the complete soul is the child of God, then it means that God wants a relationship with the complete soul. God also gave free will to the complete soul. God also gave the choice of the complete soul experiencing God's love. And any other state, a separation of the two halves, is, has been created through the process of incarnation separates them. Right? It's a natural process to separate them. And why did God do it that way? Can you see that the point is that the two halves come to have the same will? That's why God did it this way. The two halves will eventually come to have the same will. This is how you're going to recognize the other half of yourself. By you engaging your will to love and live in harmony with truth, and in that process, you'll choose to do things that are in harmony with love. And this is how you will come to recognize the other half of yourself. Because without that, you won't. See, a lot of you think, you know, you look at a person coming on the other side of the street. She's my soulmate. But you're only recognizing the physical person. It's not... You're not recognising the soul of the person. You don't know them at this stage. You don't know their desires. You don't know their passions. You can't feel them. If you can't feel them, you, you can't recognise them. You can tell yourself you do, and then you'd have a relationship with them only to find out six months later they're not your soulmate or whatever. But, but that, that's not how you're going to recognise your soulmate. You're going to recognise your soulmate by engaging your will. You can see, see that? Holy crap. Yeah, holy crap, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a clever little system, huh? It's a clever monumental system. <laughs> Alex, you'd like to ask. Um, say I do an art class, mm -hmm. right? And there's fifty people in the art class and half of them are women. Mm -hmm. And they're all in their passions. And I'm in my passion. Mm -hmm. Um, doesn't mean they're my soulmate. Of course it doesn't. No. 
just because someone has one passion that's similar to yours, it doesn't mean that the tens of thousands of passions that you're capable of having are all the same. So you're saying <coughs> that this, the whole heap of passions will just align? Of course. Right. But only in the pure state, right? This yeah. is why, you know, making decisions about who your soulmate is based on your injuries is pointless exercise because all you're doing is matching up codependent addictions. Yeah. You need to engage your will in harmony with love and truth before you're ever going to in find your soulmate. Well, that's one of the advantages of doing it. Mm. Mm. It's important, eh? Okay, so the question then becomes, of course, well, what, what, what are the things that control my will, that, that determine the exercise of my will? What, what, what is my will influenced by? And when I'm talking about my will, for me, I'm talking about my and Mary's collective will. That's what I'm talking about, me and the other half of me. Not, it's not just me, it's me and the other half of me. What, what, what is going to influence my will? Well, let's look at it. There's a number of different influences upon the will of the complete soul. The first one is thoughts that we have in our mind, in our brain, have an influence upon the will of the soul. You know, someone might just say something to me, just in passing, you know like knocks on my door and says, you want to come down surfing? They're influencing my will, are they not? They've just transmitted a thought to my brain through the use of language and they've asked me if I want to go surfing and if, if my desire was that, yeah, I probably wouldn't mind doing that, before then I might not even thought about that. But I've, I've dropped a thought in my mind and, and it connects with another thing that influences my will inside of me, which is my feelings and emotions. So it connects with that and I go, yeah, I wouldn't mind going. So just a thought has the, impact, has the ability to impact my use of my will. Emotions are more obvious, right, in terms of the way that they impact my will. If I have an emotion to avoid something, then you know you can try to convince somebody to do something that they have an emotion to avoid, and it's highly unlikely they'll do it unless they can be it can be proven to them through logical reasoning ability, thoughts that uh, that it's probably advisable to do it, that they'll actually might enjoy it or whatever, and that's connecting to another feeling inside of them that maybe my fear is not worth listening to and maybe I might enjoy it you know so that's connecting is giving them some inspiration but which is really just dropping thoughts into the minds of people is it not that's what inspiration really is dropping th thoughts whether it comes from a spirit or from a person's immaterial really okay now, there's certain type of emotions that you could probably be more specific about. One, one of those kinds of emotions is desires. Will definitely have an impact upon the will, won't they? So if I really badly want something, then it's highly likely I'll, I'll take some action to, do it, to get it. Highly likely. You could say desires, desires are the feelings inside of me that I feel I want to satisfy right now. That's probably a good definition of desires. Feelings inside of me that I'd like to satisfy immediately. But then there's a different type of desires, which, are, which I call aspirations, which are really the feelings that I'd like to satisfy in some point in the future or that I feel are possible to satisfy at some point in the future that I'd like to also act upon now. Right, so they have an influence upon me as well. So when we use the term longing, that's really a desire, isn't it? A feeling in me, I've got to do this. But it's sort of like a mixture, isn't it, of desire and aspiration a longing 
because it's for some future thing that has not happened right now that I need to at least have some faith that has happened so actually my faith will influence my exercise of my will if I believe something is possible and I have enough desire to do it it will definitely affect my choices that I make after that point but if I don't believe it's possible right, then it's highly likely that I will not choose to do it is that not true if I believe something's possible I probably choose to do it if I wanted it but if I don't believe it's possible at all even if it is it's highly unlikely I'm going to choose to do it so obviously faith does have an impact upon my exercise of my will that's why faith is such an important quality in the soul to develop because it it's one of the things that motivates is your future aspirations so it's a very powerful quality to develop inside of the soul. Now I'm capable of having thoughts, emotions, desires, aspirations, faith and all these different things independent of Mary but only because, independent of my soulmate in other words, only because we believe ourselves to be separate. But once we start to see that actually we're not separate, we realize that actually I'm not really capable of having an independent longing, desire, faith, whatever, without my soulmate being affected by that particular choice I'm making. Mm -hmm. Now, your will is also influenced, interestingly, by actions that you take. Because you can take an action and that result in a completely new thought being created and therefore influencing the will via the fact that you took an action and then something happened and that caused you to now think about or feel about a certain way and then that's influenced your will for the next time you make that same action. So actions can actually have this feedback mechanism on the soul that causes you to influence your will. Now... If you look at all of those things that are influencing my will, and there's many other things, but we'll just look at these particular things at the moment. There's many other qualities, by the way, that influence my will. But, but if we look at these very basic things at the moment, which we've presented to you many times before, can you see that the thoughts can come from my own mind or they could come from someone else's? Can you see the emotions could come from my own feelings, but they could also come from somebody else's? The desires could come from my own feelings, but they could also be influenced by the desires of other people around me, couldn't they? The aspirations that I have can be influenced by the inspiration from others. The faith could also be influenced by others. And even my actions could be influenced by others. So actually, the way my will gets developed is very much about the interplay between Firstly, all of these things occurring inside of myself, but also all of these things occurring from external sources. Sandra, you'd like to ask? <coughs> Is this related to exactly what you were saying yesterday, like that it's either an aspiration from our own self that we can follow and mm -hmm. therefore use our will, or get really like inspired by someone instead, which is from the outside source. Yeah, but there's no harm in the inspiration. Yeah. There's depending only on a it's de yeah, depending on my own already in aspiration inside of me, really, what I want to do with my will. Yeah, like so. So, for example, if I told you you were a lesbian, right, and you know you're not, then my thought that I've transmitted to you would have no effect on you, right? But if I told you you were a lesbian, but but you had questions about whether you were and questions about your own sexuality and whether you were or weren't it could send you into a huge meltdown just that one transmission of a thought right so that depends on the choice made by the person receiving the information doesn't it as to what actually finishes up happening with the information received and then if you acted upon it but it was not true you could see you could do all sorts of things in that place acting upon it not being true um, could cause all sorts of problems for your future but but it could cause you to disconnect from your soul and everything just one thought just me saying one comment and if you 
You see, this is the power of our interplay of, and interactions with everyone. Is We do have effects on people, right? There's, there's no doubt about that. But, but again, how you use your will will determine how negative or positive those particular suggestions are. Now, we've already raised the other issue with you, and that is this. And, and we'd like to go for, forward on this particular discussion, and that is quite simple there's three ways you could use your will one of them's pretty much physically impossible but i'll write it down anyway one is to never use it <laughs> in other words you take no action to develop it or anything like that now like i said that's impossible it's actually impossible the way god's made the universe for you to not use your will for example god's inbuilt inside of you certain passions and desires that in the end are going to drive some of your behavior i'll give you some examples from physical ones a physical one that's a passion or desire is to eat sooner or later it's going to drive your behavior <laughs> right it will sooner or later it will drive your behavior the thirst for a drink Sooner or later, it will drive your behaviour. It's highly unlikely you won't listen to it. Right? Highly unlikely that you'll have to listen to it at some point because the physical body has its needs and, and you need to satisfy them to, in order to survive. So, so there's some things that are inbuilt that are already demonstrating to you, and this is, this is a beautiful thing God has done as well, is God's put into, in, inside of our body these things that start teaching us about will before we even are conscious of the concept of will they start teaching us about desire will and so forth so so it's impossible to to get to the stage where we never use our will physically impossible right so so we might as well rub that out hey it's not going to happen so there's only two other ways we can use our will One way is to use it in a loving manner and another way is to use it in an unloving manner. This way, from God's perspective, perspective is perfect and from this way, from God's perspective, is sin. There we are. Now you know everything about your will. <laughs> Maybe not everything, but you know the key points about it. So, I, as an individual, can influence your will by having my own thoughts, motions, desires, aspirations, faith and taking action. I can influence your will. I can. And you can do the same to me. Right? And it frequently does happen where we, where we do things that influence another person. The question becomes, how do I allow myself to be influenced? And how do I allow myself to influence others? Can you see that? So how do I allow myself to be influenced? And then how do I allow myself to, be, to influence others is going to be the primary use of my will, isn't it? I can influence you. God gave me the ability to influence you. You can influence me. God gave you the ability to influence me. How I respond to your influence will depend greatly upon my exercise of my own will. How I choose to influence you will depend greatly upon my exercise of my own will. So, Graham? When your will's highly developed, does it mean that my thoughts, emotions, desires, etc., perhaps won't have an influence on, for example, yourself? They will have an influence, always. Will they affect? Your will. 
well, or your soul. They can't affect me unless I choose to let them affect me, which is an exercise of my will. Yes. You see? Yeah. So, so for example, if I'm a celestial spirit, mm -hmm. I would not influence your will if you didn't want me to. So I wouldn't even have a conversation with you unless you wanted me to. Right. So this is why many times, I don't know if you noticed, but many times I don't have conversations with you. I walk past you and I don't have a conversation. Why do I have conversation with some people and not others? It's because I can feel from that person they're afraid and therefore they're exercising their will to not have the conversation. So I can't have a conversation with you under those circumstances. That's the wrong thing for me to do. You're exercising your will, telling me that I don't want a conversation and I'm going, no worries. I want to use my will in a loving way. I don't want to force you to have a conversation with me. Many of you do the opposite to me, though. Many of you come up and force a conversation with me. Have you noticed that, too? Mm. Even though I might you haven't asked yourself whether I want to have the conversation. Because it, most of the time we can't even feel the other person to know that. Right? Can you see why emotions are so important? If I can feel your emotions, I can feel, yeah, you don't want to talk to me, that's fine. I'm okay with that. And I don't take it personally, I don't try to force myself on you or anything like that. Huh? It's up to you what you choose to do. But if somebody really wants to have a conversation with me and we, wa and we want to talk about the same thing, and I feel we do, then I'll, I'll definitely have a conversation with them. It'd be an unusual circumstance for me not to do that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? But again, that's dependent upon the will of the other person and my will. Yeah. So what we need to understand firstly is that there are a couple of ways we can use our will, really. There's only really two ways we use our will. One way is to be loving and perfect and sinless, right? And the other way is an unloving way, so therefore sinful. Right? But if we, look at a bit, if we look at this issue a bit f further, negative changes to my will, how do they occur? They occur by my choice to sin or my choice to leave the sin that's already inside of me there. So there's two things in that. I can choose to do a new sin. Can I not? All right, so let's make it a new sin. Or I can leave the old sin. inside of me and if I choose to do any of those two things it's going to somehow influence all of these things which will have an effect on my soul in a negative direction it's going to influence or impact upon how I finish up using my will can you see that so Choosing to have a new sin actually impacts my will negatively and choosing to not release old sin has an impact on my will negatively too. Now many of you live every single day like that where you've chosen even just to not do old sin, not release old sin and so of course it's going to have a negative influence on your will. So for example, the old sin which is if I... If I do the wrong thing, I'm going to get, you know, God's laws will, you know, correct me. If I do the right thing, I don't even know what the right thing is. So I've decided I'm going to do nothing. Right? Many of you have done that for a few years, tried that out, see how that's worked. Well, there's no such thing as nothing. You've left the old sin inside of you. Even the choice to do nothing is an old sin in itself saying that you've got that option, which you, from God's perspective, you don't really have that option, do you? Right? So, so leaving the old sin inside of you, not an option. And so what's going to happen is the choice to do nothing is actually going to have a negative effect on your soul and therefore pain. Therefore, you will experience pain as a result of that choice to do nothing. The, the spirit world in the lower spheres, the spirit world in the first sphere, the hells of the spirit world are full of people who chose to do nothing for that reason because the old sin remained within them and it, and choosing to do nothing is actually a sin in itself which then adds to the negative influences upon the soul Alex 
And by old sin do you mean not going through the process of of sin, I mean any damage error, that entered you from the point of conception onwards emotionally yeah. that is now within you that causes you to act all of that stuff is old sin stuff done in the past yeah whether yeah. it's by other people or yourself makes no difference yeah but does that have the ability to to influence you in the future because you haven't gone through the process of course of, of feeling the error and then seeing why you did it which then removes the error correct is that why yeah right. it has it has a terrible influence on your future decisions every single day many of you do not realize this but every single day you are making terrible decisions a lot of the times because of the refusal to remove old sin to remove old emotions which are sinful and and as a result you act upon those emotions out of harmony with love and you just automatically do it and as a result of that you're actually creating new sin just by acting upon the old one like to to get rid of sin needs to be, uh, be there be, needs to be a willingness to address the old stuff that has happened before now before the right this moment in time as well as address the issue of whether you want to do new ones it requires both you see yeah very very important to understand Jetta, thanks Sorry. <laughs> um, is that why when we act in an addiction, or when I act in an addiction, it tends to uh, make it easier to act in the addiction again the next time? And yes, you like actually do. Every time you act in an addiction, you degrade your condition because you're actually committing a new sin. Mm -hmm. Besides acting upon an old one, you're now committing a new sin. You're adding to the sin, so you're committing a new sin. And that new sin degrades your soul condition even further. And therefore it's easier the next time you do it yep. and then easier again the next time you do it easier again the next time you do it and by the time if you keep on acting upon sin upon sin upon sin upon sin it's going to be easy to sin in all sorts of ways why, why do you feel like people like the caesars in the first century that i can remember you know did all sorts of terrible things like murdered thousands of people tens of thousands millions of people you know just had sex with whoever they chose who raped whoever they wanted why do you think they did all these things? Because they first chose the act and it then caused the degradation for the next act. Then it causes the degradation for the next act and so forth. And eventually you get to the stage where it doesn't even bother you anymore that those particular actions are being taken. And so you engage them willingly because they just feed addiction, feed addiction, take the next action. That's how the degradation of the soul occurs. That's actually how the hells got created. Because if mankind didn't do that, there'd be no hell. The hells had to be created because the condition of the people needed that location in order to survive. Right? That's how they got created, by this incessant action upon old sin, creating new sin, feeding back into the soul. The soul degrades in its condition of love every single act taken. So, so can you see just taking one action can be a problem because it can lead you to the next one and the next one and the next one before you know it. Does that make sense? It's far better to try to remove the old sin than it is to act upon it. All right. Now the same applies on the loving side of things obviously. Does that make sense? The way I become loving and perfect is the opposite to that. So the way I become loving and perfect is to remove my old sin and don't do any more new ones. It's quite simple. All right, that's all I've got to do. Remove the old sin, don't create any more new ones. And eventually, with, and particularly if I'm asking for God's love, I'll become perfect. But even if I'm not asking for God's love, I'll be a perfected, natural person in the sixth dimension of the spirit world in that place. That's better than where the earth is. Even if we just did that without God at all, even if we didn't believe in God at all and we just did that, we would undo the effects of everything that's occurring on earth just doing that. That's without God. Yep. Amber, thanks. Um, so just so I understand what you're saying, if we were to 
stop sinning today but leave our old sin in us, we would progress. So if we stop sinning today yep, and, and we leave our old sin in us, yeah, but just, no, we won't progress. Okay. Why? Because the old sin will determine our new actions. Our old sin will cause us to engage further sin. You've got to do both. You can't do one or the other. <laughs> so many of you who have said, okay, I'm just not going to do anything at all in the hope that that's not sinning, that's, that's not actually helping you. That's why it hasn't helped. And the law of conversation surely is showing you that it hasn't helped, right? You can go like that for years and make no changes at all and in fact your life still gets worse because you are actually acting upon the old sin still. It's inevitable while it's in you, in fact, that you act upon it. The only real action that you can take is to release it. That's the only real action that can be taken. Release the old sin and then there's a less likelihood you act upon it. Does that make sense? We go, Jen. I know this might be a crazy question, mm -hmm. but can you flick a switch inside of you <laughs> in which you make the decision um, to, to change? Or is it a gradual... Well, you remember, your, th there's a difference between will and willpower. And now I'm not going into that discussion because we've already covered it Understand. two years ago. Yes. And so I, I suggest that people go back to the discussion two years okay. ago to identify the difference. But what you're suggesting is, do I, can I use my willpower to flick my will over? And I'm suggesting no, because, because your will is exercised through all of these things. These things are all going to have to change before your will is going to change. And it's up to you to change them. Then how do you not drown in the constant law, law of compensation? You're already drowning in it. Yes. You, you, it's not going to get any worse than where you currently are. It can't get worse unless you choose to do new sins. But if I choose not to act, which is... Which is I, a new sin. Yes. Then it's going to get worse. Then it gets and worse. And if you choose to not release old sin... Yes. Then it's going to get worse. Can you see? Yes. So it's really quite simple. All I've got to do is release old sin and work on any desire that I have to create a new sin, to work on why that desire is occurring so, and release that from me so I don't want to do it anymore. And is there such a thing as, as ignorance in any of this? No. No, there's not. Okay. People, okay. people like to think there is. Which is the reason why ignorance is chosen. I would like to think like that too. Yeah, no, but that's all because you don't want to take action. And that's fear. Well, no, it's not just fear. In your case, it's rage. Okay. I told you that a few days ago, remember? Yes, you did. It's not fear. You keep, even after I've told you what it is, you still want to go back to being fear. Why? Because it's easier to tell yourself that it's fear rather than rage. Than to take responsibility for the actual... For the rage. The effects that it's having on everything and everyone. Well, you take responsibility it. for your rage, yeah. I see it. Yeah, Thank you me. don't want to do that. Yeah. Julie, thanks. <coughs> so, is, are you saying that all... Uh, no, can I ask you? <laughs> is all new sin based on old sin? No. It's not? No. So you can do a new sin that's got no Somebody basis. could come along and say, Julie, you want to come out partying with me? And you say, yeah, I'll go out partying. There's nothing wrong with that. So you go out partying. And then they say, Julie, see that guy over there? He's interested in you. And you go, yeah, he is. I can feel he's interested in me. Why don't you go to bed with him? All right? Now, you can choose in that moment, even if you're perfect, you could choose in that moment to go to bed with him. You could. But now, I if you were perfect, it would be less likely that you would choose it because you'd go, hang on a sec, that's influencing my soulmate, that's going to harm me, and, and you know all those kind of things. Uh, but, but you could still be perfect and make that choice. And Mon and a man, the first human couple, made a choice to reject God even though they were perfect. So they chose a sin even though they were perfect. Yes, you can choose a sin even if you're perfect. You can. It's highly unlikely you'll do it. 
particularly if you've learnt the process of what goes on and you learnt the negative effect of sin, but you can still do it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So yes, many of us, uh, yeah, we, we can choose, we can choose. And, and, and you know, that's how the degradation of humankind happened, by people making that choice. And then making another choice, and then making another choice, and making another choice. And then each choice you make to sin becomes easier. And eventually it becomes so easy that it's normal. Your conscience doesn't bother you anymore. You don't think there's anything wrong with it anymore. You've got all these explanations as to why it's not a problem anymore, and so forth. And this is a problem, is that, you know, eventually we get ourselves to think that, oh, like, this is how 100 million children die every year. None of us think it's a problem. This is how 50 million children die from abortion every year. Every woman who has an abortion doesn't see it as a murder. That's how, because we, we make an action based upon choices, decisions, we get worse and worse and worse and worse, until we get to the point where we're justifying even a murder of a child. And yet, and yet if I got a child right in front of you now and murdered it, you'd think I'd be the worst person on earth, right? And yet, that's what many of us are doing. <laughs> and even justifying it to each other, saying, yeah, I did the right thing. Yeah, you want to ask again? Thank you. So the second and third abortions I had... You keep saying this, but it's the first one you had. I know, but I'm saying it's, it's the result of... The first one. Of the first That's why one. I said to you in the a discussion previously yes. that the first one was the most important. Po yeah. Even though you felt it was the least important. Yeah, I use my fear as the excuse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that now. Yeah. yeah. And I'm saying it's the most important. It, it enabled all the others. Yes. It was the decision made that was now backed up by action, that was now justified, that was now... And it enables the next one, and it enables the next one. Does that make sense? Because I de de degraded my soul. In the first one? In the first one. Yeah. Yeah. And that enabled the next one. And how did you degrade your soul? You had some thoughts that it was going to be justified. You had some feelings that you had to prevent, you know, having a child. And, and a number of different things influenced the first choice. They influenced it negatively to sin, and then the, the ne that sin made the next sin easier. Yeah, it did. Yeah. It just made me more crafty. Yeah. 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 Yep. Interesting, isn't it? David, thanks. So, can I use my willpower to kind of kickstart the process? No, you can't. Your willpower is ineffectual. Your willpower is about avoiding your will. Remember, uh, maybe we should have gone through <laughs> two years ago again because in that discussion two years ago, Mary said to you that when you use willpower, it's directly to avoid the use of your will. It's directly to overcome the use of your will. It's, so uh, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting your will needs to change. Now, I'm already suggesting here how it's going to change. You're going to have to feed your thoughts, emotions, desires, aspirations, faith and action on sinless things, things that don't create sin. At the moment, a lot of our thoughts, emotions, desires, aspirations, faith and action is on sinful things. So they finish it up degrading our condition. What we're going to have to do is do these things so that they're sin on sinless things. We're going to have to feed ourselves on sinless things, aren't we? feed ourselves on sinless things we're now living in more in harmony with love part of that is removing old sin and not doing new sin but as we do that there'll be a positive growth it's like the same way the, the degradation occurs through feeding back on the negative end the the positive growth occurs by feeding back on the positive end it's what you feed yourself on what you think about what you desire to do like, they are the things that are going to influence your will in a positive direction. It's not rocket science, actually, is it? It's really just quite simple, really, in the end. If we choose to not release our old sin and engage new sin, then there's going to be a negative feedback system which will degrade our soul. And if we choose to release old sin, so on this side, if I just write that down, release if I can call it old sin, you know, which is the stuff that's already inside of us, and to not sin, then of course we've got the positive 
feedback occurring into the system. So our condition of how and how we use our will will grow. Yeah. If we go to Graham, thanks. So if my will currently is to sin, um, rather than using willpower, I have to find thoughts or emotions or desires or aspirations or faith that I have to go looking for some of those that I might have the will to do, even though most of them my will may be to act to sin. Yeah. So at some point there's got to be a will-based choice to desire to find all the things that are causing the will to be exercised negatively. So in other words, I need to have a passionate desire to do that, right? So that's like a, that's me having a passionate desire for the truth now, a passionate desire to feel my emotions, a passionate desire to you know, have some faith in God and God's goodness so that I can work through this issue, and a passionate desire to take action. Does that make sense? If I exercise my desires in that regard, because I can have those desires, they're just aspirations of the soul, I can have them. And if I have them, now I've got a way of unravelling the mess, of, of reversing it all. So it's like, um, if I have a really strong will to sin, um, I'm basically going looking for the weak points in that will, which will give me a bit of will to do some of these yeah, I'll probably do it the other way, Graham, myself. I look at, I look at the, the biggest ways that I'm sinning, because usually you know what they are, and then, then I know that if I, can, if, I can find, if I can find the underlying reason why I do that, which is about releasing emotion, then, then I won't do that anymore, and that will be the biggest improvement to my life. So I actually focus on the biggest things, not the smallest things. But First. what if I don't have the will to focus on the biggest things? Well, that's an exercise again of your will. Your will is influenced by thoughts, emotions, desires, aspirations, faith. So, so what I would do is I'd, I'd, I'd look at my life and I'd go, like the next discussion, I'd go, what's causing my pain? What's causing my pleasure? Do I want more pleasure or do I want more, more pain? You know, like I'd, I'd use the logical thinking ability that God gave me to work out whether that's the wisest course of action or not. And that would also help me identify... Uh, some of the false beliefs and as those false beliefs leave me if I'm willing to process them emotionally they'll leave me if I if I let them leave me then now I'll change my mind on those particular subjects and therefore be influenced to deal with the other problems do you see what I'm saying not really not really does so anybody else not see what's going on here because this was meant to be an hour discussion and it's already <laughs> longer than an hour discussion and maybe what we need to do is put all of this in a q and a the q and a afterwards right should we so so what if we do that what if what if i just leave you with what i've just presented there as the discussion and then i'll get back to this question that you've asked if we we just have a break to one o'clock and i'll get back to this question that you've asked and we'll focus our attention on uh, try to work out how it works thank you yeah?